Thank you, Tess. So uh, welcome to Thursday. This is the Visualizing the Future Symposium. This is day two. This is our last day of kind of multiple scheduled events. And tomorrow we have a half day workshop for people who have already registered. Um, today's schedule is that we've already had a little bit of chit chat this morning and um, we're gonna have lightning talks for the next 50 minutes or so. There are five lightning talks scheduled from different members of the project team. After that, we'll have a short break and then we're gonna have a vis and tell, which is kind of an open public discussion. And the topic of the vis and tell is um, organizing our community and next steps for the vis and tell series. Um, so we definitely want a, a good turnout for that if you're available. Um, we'll have an hour where there's time for people to take a little break, maybe grab some food, um, if, if that's a, a good lunchtime for you, but we'll also be hosting another set of unconference and small group discussions here in the main room or in the, in the Zoom room. And we'll have breakout rooms based on the interests of people who are there. And then um, we have a fabulous invited speaker coming at three o'clock where we will uh, hear from Dr. May Lee Blackwell on uh, mapping in indigenous Los Angeles. So again, not to be missed, it will be fabulous. And then we'll just do a, um, a reflection and close out at the end of the day with the organizers. Um, after that, uh, Andy has volunteered to host um, a social gathering for people on the West Coast. And uh, maybe we can do a community um, playlist generation just to, to have a little bit more social time and then again, tomorrow, people who are registered for the workshop, you should already have the information for that. So some logistics for today, just make sure that um, you're keeping an eye on chat. If you want to communicate with people, you can chat to everyone. Uh, there are um, live transcripts available. We have a captioner in the room today and we really appreciate that. And then if there are sessions where we don't have a live captioner, we'll make sure to turn on the auto transcription um, to at least uh, support a little bit um, of that need. And then we'll um, also be paying attention to the chat. So if you want to chat anonymously or you want to say something just directly to the hosts, you can um, direct a chat message to me or to Justin. And then I'll also make Andy a co-host as well. And um, we are the three grant organizers and we'll be happy to address any issues that come up. And for any remaining links, and uh, information, you should always make sure to head back to our symposium website, which is at visualizingthefuture.github slash symposium github.io slash symposium. And I'll put that in the chat right now. So we've got um, we've got a uh, yeah, we've got a um, nice slate of uh, talks and I don't think I don't think we need to have any more reminders so without further ado I will hand it over to Tess and each talk will last about five to seven minutes and we may have time for one or two questions in between but hopefully we'll leave some time at the end as well for questions. Awesome thank you so much Angela. Um, Hello, everyone. My name is Tess Granuk, and I am a research data and scholarly communications librarian at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. And I'm so excited to be kicking off these lightning talks. And I'm going to be presenting today on behalf of the instructional material teams to give an overview of the two modules that we made as part of these grant. And so to access both of these modules, they're both located on that visualizingthefuture.github.io site that Angela mentioned. Uh, earlier where you've been finding the agenda. It's on the resources page. And David, thank you so much, is going to be putting links to everything I'm going to be showing to you today in the chat. So if you want to follow along with me as I do the demo, uh, feel free to do so. So uh, the first module that I wanted to bring you into today is this ethics and data visualization module. And so I already have it open here, but if you click that link, it'll bring you directly to this page. And uh, this site went live in August. Uh, it was a module designed to introduce basic topics around ethics and data visualization. And it was voted by the fellows as the first module that we should develop. And if you uh, remember, this was also a vis and tell at, on May 14th, uh, 2021. And we, the reason why uh, we had the vis and tell, and then it took us a few months to make this site live, is that we are taking all that feedback that we received from you and this to finalize our final slides and activities 
which we are so excited to share with the community. Now, both modules that I'm going to be showing you today are meant to be remixed to meet a variety of different situations and audiences. For example, uh, the instructor notes included in the slides have uh, suggestions for alternative examples that may be more interesting to certain groups uh, and the activities can be adapted to different amounts of time and different teaching settings. So uh, if you scroll down the page here, you'll see that we have a proposed timeline and this is just a suggestion and it can be expanded with extra discussion or shortened by removing content. And the teaching flexibility also uh, is in the activities as well. So if you go into the mapping census data activity, you'll see here that we have, uh, they're all broken down uh, into sort of this description, being able to download the files as a, a whole group. So this includes the instructor slides, as well as any handouts that you need to give to students. Uh, and then instructions on uh, suggestions on how to run the activity as a whole class, as well as a small group. And we've also provided a link here to provide the handouts uh, as a virtual platform so that you can just share the link with the students directly and you don't need to host them somewhere else if you uh, choose not to. So to get back to the uh, main site, uh, wherever you are, uh, regardless of what page you're on, just click on the ethics and data visualization or the title of the module. And uh, just to give you a little bit of a overview of the two activities, that mapping census uh, ACS data activity that I was showing you looks at the impact of intersectionality and the intersecting identities when mapping demographic data. And the example uses American Community Survey data to map Mississippi counties. And the second uh, activity that we have is the redesigning economist charts activity. And this looks at the impact of chart elements on the clarity of the chart's message and how changing the elements can improve the clarity of the message and how to avoid confusion. So that brings me to the end of the ethics and data visualization module to present to you our brand new data visualization 101 module that was just released this week and you uh, would have received the link uh, in your email as well. And uh, this module is meant to give a general overview of data visualization. And uh, we've recorded, this module is broken down into individual sections and we have recorded each section in this YouTube playlist. And so uh, it's broken down to nine sections and uh, we changed up who recorded uh, which section. So you're gonna hear, hear some different voices in the recordings. And the sections are, what is data visualization, visual principles and properties, key parts of a data visualization, types of a data visualization and examples, approaching data visualization with a critical eye, preparing and understanding data, how are data visualizations made, designing for accessibility from the beginning, and designing for reproducibility from the beginning. And uh, as with the ethics in data visualization module, um, sorry, I just want to actually, I'm just going to briefly show you how this looks in the slides because we have have a single slide deck for all of these different sections, but each section has its own header with a header slide that's going to look like this. So uh, as I was starting to mention earlier, uh, as with the uh, ethics and data visualization module, we have activities that go along with this module as well. And so uh, we have uh, uh, several to choose from, and each of them is broken down. It has an introduction, some different possible sources and resources to uh, pull your either the chart example from uh, generally, and has a total recommended time, as well as the, any tools or materials that are required to complete that activity. And uh, the, what I like about uh, this particular about the chart makeover walkthrough is that these charts uh, could also be alternatives that you might want to use for the uh, economist uh, redesign chart activity that you saw in the ethics in data visualization module. 
uh, because even though we use economist charts in that activity, they can be easily replaced with other charts and using the same questions. And uh, the, all of the activities in this module are a mixture of uh, group activities as well as individual activities. And to, you can, even though for uh, this module, if you scroll down the page in the proposed timeline section, uh, we have uh, the activities listed at the bottom. You can intersperse activities anywhere throughout uh, the course, wherever it seems to fit best. And uh, if, for example, if I was doing a one hour sequence, I could use which charts would you choose version two, which is the shorter uh, version, maybe in, after this types of data visualization and examples. So uh, to give a little bit of a break before finishing with the approaching visualizations with a critical eye section. And since the sections are recorded, they can also be assigned as pre-class materials. So you have more time for activities during the class period. And uh, the PDF of the slides should be coming soon. They're just going through an accessibility check. Now we hope that these can be living modules. So we need your feedback. And the best way to give this feedback is through a GitHub issue. And to put in a GitHub issue, you can either click on the view project on GitHub or view on GitHub button on the either of the module pages. And I'm just gonna click on this one here. And you'll need to log into GitHub or create a GitHub account. It is a very simple sign up process. And once you're on the page, you'll wanna go to issues and then create a new issue and then submit uh, whatever feedback or uh, changes that you would like to see or suggestions, uh, we would love to hear them. Thank you so much. And if there's any questions, I, Angela, if we have time, I'm happy to take them. Yeah, we can have um, one or two questions really quickly as we transition maybe. So Tess, maybe we'll have you stop sharing and we can get um, Ryan started. Any quick questions for Tess? Everyone is bowled over. <laughs> okay, feel free to, yeah, feel free to hold questions. And um, if, if something comes up later, we're happy to answer any questions here or oh. in Slack or anything like that. I'll Ellie, speak. do you have a question? I don't have a question, but I just wanna say what an outstanding resource this is. And um, I love this, the bones, you know, how it, you have it all structured out to, it's, uh, to you know, to grow. and. It's amazing, and we'll definitely wander over and loiter. Thank you. Good. Well, thank, thank you, very, you much. very much. Okay, I think we're all set. Ryan, are you ready? Yes, I think I'm ready. Can folks see my are my slides shared properly? Okay, it looks perfect. Great. Um, so, yeah, thank you all uh, for coming to to listen today. My name is Ryan Clement. I am the data services librarian at Middlebury College. Um, for folks who don't know, Middlebury College, um, we're primarily a small undergraduate liberal arts college, but we also have a number of graduate schools um, in languages and literatures and a professional school in international studies in Monterey, California. Um, so uh, lots, of, lots of different folks over um, many different time zones, which uh, plays into this lightning talk. Um, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit today about um, an activity that we've done as part of the Visualizing the Future uh, project, as well as um, something that I took and uh, worked on at Middlebury um, for building community discussion. Um, these vis and tells that you've heard talk of, um, and uh, the, the version we call them at uh, Middlebury is Coffee Breaks. Um, so, um, get started uh, to uh, these two proposals. Um, so Middlebury College has had a, a proposal that um, was somewhat inconveniently um, approved right before um, we, we started into a global pandemic called the Middlebury Initiative for Data and Digital Methods or Mid Data for short. Um, and then there's the Visualizing the Future call for proposals. And both of these projects had a, a strong, um, a strong goal of having building a critical community, um, you know, engaging folks in discussion uh, around 
um, topics and uh, you know deeper discussion than just tool workshops and things. Um, but then suddenly, as I noted, we we all became uh, remote workers at least temporarily, um, and slightly before the pandemic uh, started happening in our regular visualizing the future meetings, which were um, uh, monthly online meetings, we had been talking about how we were having great semi-structured discussions on various topics. Um, and, and these topics were great and they were fruitful and they were uh, we all appreciated them because we rarely got time to see each other and discuss these things uh, together. Um, and we, we thought, uh, how do we move these things into the broader community? How do we take these discussions we're having and, and um, bring them to a wider audience? Um, we started thinking in one of these meetings about some different inspirations. We, we thought about things like uh, Makeover Mondays and Tidy Tuesdays, um, although these things were more you know, hands-on, like getting deep into code. They, they seemed more workshoppy than we wanted. They looked more at like tools and digging into code. Um, we looked at the Data Visualization Society's fireside chats, um, which were also a great inspiration, um, but these were pitched a little bit more towards expertise and practitioners. Um, they were a little bit more focused on the experts. Um, if you've been to one of them, um, they're, they're great conversations, but they're, they're more focused on you know, asking questions of a panel and having responses. Um, and then you know, there's also the kind of ubiquitous Twitter discussions that happen out there where you know, we'll, we'll have a discussion and everybody use this hashtag and we're having a discussion on Twitter. Um, and for some of us, myself in particular, those can get overwhelming. I can't really follow a discussion on Twitter. Um, so we wanted to have something that was uh, a little bit more um, uh, engaging for folks, especially when we didn't have time to, um, as many opportunities to see each other's faces. Um, so we decided to try out these vis and tells. Um, and the model um, that's kind of evolved, this was never, I don't think, I don't think this was ever formalized in any way, either through vis the, the Visualizing the Future community or um, with those of us at Middlebury in our coffee breaks. Um, but the kind of model that's evolved is that these discussions are open to all. They're not limited towards people with a particular um, title or status or expertise or skill level. Um, they're, they're open to all. In particular, at Middlebury, we really try and um, engage students with these. We want students to come so that students, staff, and faculty can all be involved in the discussion. Um, they're very much discussion-focused. Um, even when someone is coming to present a, a project they have, it's more show your project and then have a discussion, not necessarily a demo, full demo of a project. Um, we can bring in guest experts as appropriate. So folks who have expertise in a certain topic um, can come and, and host these um, because one of the other big uh, principles is that these things should have low barriers to participation. We don't want people to feel like they have to write an entire you know, 15, 20 minute talk to come present at one of these as an expert. Um, we don't want the uh, participants to feel like they have to, you know, read three articles before they can come participate. Um, we want this to be something that is like, that's why we called it a coffee break at Middlebury, like a coffee break. You can come in, you can drop in and get into part of the discussion. Um, aimed at a whole range of experience levels. So, you know, there are things that can engage people who have more experience, um, but we also want them to be open to folks who are novices in any of the topics as well um, to, to, again, build that, uh, build that sense of community. Again, there's no heavy pre-discussion requirements, so um, this, this will come up later as uh, one of the challenges in getting across this idea that there's not a lot of um, work beforehand. Um, and we've also tried, not always successfully, but tried to be very good about having community notes for these um, because they're community discussions and uh, folks often bring a lot of great examples, uh, links, ideas. Um, we wanted to have community notes that could live on um, because these are uh, not always the most useful things to record. Um, these, they, I mean, they're, they're fairly open discussions, um, so they're, they're not necessarily an, e uh, an easy thing to you know, record or listen to a recording of afterwards. Um, cover a number of different topics. Both of these uh, things have been going on, the, the Visintels and the coffee breaks for, um, a little over a year now. Um, the the visualizing the future ones have um, 
obviously focused more on visualization topics. So we've looked at things like uh, visualization and library assessment, um, how to te how to teach tools, how to select tools, how to be tool agnostic in your stances. Um, the we we looked as Tess noted at the visualizing future ethics instruction module, showed that, and then had discussion around the module itself before it was finalized. Um, in the mid-lab coffee breaks, we've uh, been a bit more um, broad in our topics because we're focusing on not just uh, data visualization, but data and digital scholarship. So we've had talks on uh, opening up your scholarship, um, how virtual machines can lead to access equity, equity for, for students, um, web accessibility, document accessibility. Um, and upcoming uh, topics include data visualization tools again and open source tools. Um, these topics are generally uh, determined for visualizing the future. We kind of determine these as we come up with them a little bit in advance. Um, the mid lab ones at Middlebury, we came up with a list of many, many topics. Um, I think we probably have three, three years worth of topics um, if, if nothing changes in three years. Um, but we, we voted on you know, the top, uh, top 10 or so to be our first year's worth of these topics. Um, and overall, these discussions have been very fruitful uh, for building community. We've had a uh, great turnout, um, both in the bigger Visualizing the Future community. We've had um, anywhere between 30 to 60-ish uh, participants in, in a discussion, um, which seems like a lot for a discussion, but they generally worked pretty well, um, even, even at that size, um, at you know, small Middlebury College. Um, with our 2,500 students, we've, you know, we've uh, maybe had between 10 and 30 participants, um, but again, pretty, pretty good turnout and pretty easy to manage a, an actual discussion um, for, for those levels of folks. Um, I've, the benefits I've seen, I've just seen a great mixing of folks um, opening this up, you know, to, to various uh, departments skill levels, um, faculty, staff, student statuses, <laughs> those sorts of things um, has uh, really brought folks together that I've not gotten to talk to in the past and uh, who haven't talked to each other, I think. Um, particularly being able to do it on Zoom, um, while that can sometimes uh, be a barrier to some folks, it has also let us you know, bring in folks from many different locations. We've had folks um, from across the country, um, possibly across the world, I don't know, <laughs> um, come to some of these talks. Um, I've been able to give exposure to folks for their unique areas of expertise. Um, this is something that's come up a lot at the college. You know, We have IT staff who spend their time in an office and don't often get out and talk to the public about what they do and um, what they're an expert in. Um, and this has given them a chance to step out and do that um, without a lot of, uh, without a lot of uh, need for prep work. Um, it has not been hard for organizers or facilitators. Um, I've been facilitating these at Middlebury um, for the entire time we've been doing it. And um, for a large portion of this, I've been working a lot with uh, Andy and uh, helping to organize the Visualizing the Future ones. And beyond coming up with topics and sending some emails, um, there, there hasn't been a ton of organizing work to happen. Um, and Holding them online, I think, is allowed for a lot of diversity of discussion styles. We can have the chat going. We can have people raising their hands. We can have people jumping in to talk. Um, and it allows for a lot of different uh, participation. Um, one of the biggest challenges has been getting the guest experts, at least at Middlebury, to understand that this isn't a presentation, that we only want them to come with, like, um, you know, tell us the top three things that are important about this topic and then be there to you know kind of answer questions and facilitate the discussion um, another big thing that i've heard from folks um, particularly at middlebury where you know as an institution we've been able to have coffee and snacks for these things is can't offer those things when we're online um, and then of course the the general zoom fatigue um, from folks which i'm hoping will dissipate somewhat once we're able to do more things in person um, because the uh I feel like offering these things online and allowing um, allowing folks from all over uh, to to come together um, has has been very helpful with these, um, and that is all I have to say. Um, I have time for questions, or we can hold them for later. I 
to yeah move. we may have to keep going but yeah. uh but yeah feel free to okay. yeah feel free to write the questions in the chat and then we have questions if we have time at okay. the end we'll we'll make sure to come back thank you so much ryan um i am next so i need to get mine set up and That should be good. Hopefully everybody can see that. Um, so I'm here to present on our Teach Viz by Example repository for data visualization teaching examples. Um, I'm Angela Zoss. I'm sharing this work done with my colleagues, Joe Klein and Cass Wilkinson Saldana. And additional special thanks go to Amanda West who developed an early version of the repository while still an undergraduate student at the University of Michigan. Um, so I, uh, am following up on um, all of the great work that we've already shown today, including the instructional modules, which were one of the early outcomes that we knew this grant should have. Um, but even when we are distributing instructional modules that include examples, we know that that's not necessarily gonna do everything that people need. So there is a, a need to tailor instructional modules. Um, when you're teaching, you might wanna tailor your tailor your module to a new audience or to capitalize on a new trend. And sometimes you just wanna highlight a specific technique and you don't have a current example that shows that, that particular technique for a visualization or a data set. Um, so this repository is designed to help instructors with one of the trickier tasks in course design, which is finding appropriate teaching examples. Um, so teaching, as I said, teaching data visualization topics requires uh, tailoring, visualizations or data sets to a particular audience, um, but it's actually pretty hard to find visualization examples and data set examples, partly because they need to have specific properties. Um, they need to uh, conform to the lesson that you're teaching pretty tightly and they need to be at the right level for your audience. Um, so that process of searching for example, visualizations or data sets that are good for teaching can take a lot of time and existing places where data are shared don't actually capture the information we need to evaluate the visualization or the data set. Like we might need to know exactly what fields are in the data set or what patterns are in the data. And that doesn't show up until you download the data set and start playing with it yourself. Um, so we, we saw a need for a place that was really tailored to sharing and finding data sets and visualizations designed for teaching, especially the kinds of teaching that we're promoting here in Visualizing the Future, teaching that focuses on critical skills or literacy. Um, as we were working on this project, um, which uh, was kind of inspired by discussions amongst the fellows, um, we knew that we needed to start building up the exact requirements we needed for the project. Um, we wanted to uh, combine both what we were finding in an environmental scan and also the feedback we were getting from other members of the Visualizing the Future team to, um, to uh, set up these requirements. And then we also needed to see what kinds of software was available that might help us build this sort of tool. So um, different kinds of uh, repository softwares exist, but they may not all match our needs for um, how easy they would be to spin up or how easy they would be to host or the kinds of features that they might have. What we discovered and what we landed on is a platform called WAX. Um, in 2018, the Minicomp team released WAX as a minimal computing project for producing digital ex exhibitions focused on longevity, low costs, and flexibility. Um, so WAX provides a foundation for a wide variety of minimal projects, and it has a focus on digital exhibits and image-driven digital exhibits in particular. Um, so uh, even though it has this focus on digital exhibits, um, WAX has many of the features we were looking for in a repository designed for highly visual content. We felt that the minimal computing philosophy was an excellent fit for our project because we're situated in libraries, um, we knew that we would need something easy to deploy and maintain to promote sustainability. And we felt that GitHub would be an ideal hosting platform, both for the ability to share code and for the ability to host without any fees. And WAX is designed to be hosted on GitHub. And then finally, as a team, we were really open to tools that require some light 
programming and command line processing. And so WAX does have a little bit of uh, a requirement in that um, vein, but it's um, pretty uh, pretty accessible, even if you only have just a little bit of comfort with those, those kinds of skills. Um, so what we created was teaching Viz by example, and um, most of the development has gone into the back end and setting up the repository. It's not as full as we would like, so it's not quite done yet, but um, we are happy that, uh, that the software has gotten to where it is. Um, the repository shown in these screenshots offers a gallery view, so you, you um, can look at all of the examples as a, um, as a gallery. And then clicking on an example takes you to an individual view of um, either the, the visualization or the data set, including its metadata. Uh, the WAX software helps prepare the collection metadata for display in the site. And the WAX theme sits on top of Jekyll uh, to create the image galleries and item pages with their item viewers. Um, and while WAX gave us a great starting point, we found a few features that our stakeholders and the fellows requested were not going to come um, with WAX out of the box. And so uh, we decided we wanted to go ahead and spend some time extending WAX. So the first thing we wanted to do was support metadata fields that would naturally contain lists. So describing a visualization or a data set often means that you might have a couple of different properties that you want to contain in the same field. In this case, um, the field visualization types, um, you might want to list a visualization as both a line chart and a map. And so if you um, have that kind of data structure, sometimes that's a little tricky to represent in a repository. So we had to do some extension work there. Um, next, uh, we knew that we wanted to use um, complex filtering for our repository. We wanted these checkbox filters that we could kind of combine different properties in different fields and have a more complex filtering procedure. We also um, recognized that data doc documentation is not only best practice, but was uh, something we could use to improve the design of our site. So we added a data dictionary that works with our pages to improve the field labels and the formatting. And then finally, because the items in our collections can relate directly to each other, we could have a data set related to a data visualization. We created a custom field type that allows us to link those items internally um, to an arbitrary number of, of other items. Um, our GitHub repository, which is linked at the end of the slides, includes code for all these features. Uh, we reached out to the original WAX developers to tell them what we were doing, and they got excited, especially about the facets, um, the checkbox filters. And so I ended up spending the spring and summer working with one of the original developers of WAX, Alex Gill, to bring um, together uh, the, the original WAX theme with these new checkbox filters. And now um, we've released a new theme for WAX called WAX Facets. It was released in, the, in early October and is now um, available to use. And these resources are available if you'd like to learn more about WAX and Jekyll and how to use that kind of stuff. And next steps for this repository are to try to fill it with examples. So hopefully we'll be continuing to work on that to make sure that everybody um, can, can make use of the other data sets and visualizations people find useful in visualization teaching. Um, I also may not have time for questions, but I'm happy to um, check in on chat and then uh, if we have time at the end, I will be happy to answer any questions. So next we have um, Justin with Jacques Bertin. Hi everyone, thanks Angela. Oh, sounds like your timing was absolutely perfect. Um, I will try to do the same. Let me uh, share my screen really quickly and apologies about the dog barking. The mail is being delivered, which is the um, most exciting part of the day. I think as far as he's concerned. Um, um, so I think my uh, lightning talk is going to be a little bit different, um, but I wanted to just very briefly sort of share with you all some of the work of um, Jacques Pertin. And I, I guess I don't know for sure, but if I had a guess, I'd imagine that some of you are, are well acquainted with his work and maybe some of you have not heard of his work um, at all. So I kind of wanted to talk specifically about um, 
what it is that I find inspiring about his work and, and how in a lot of ways it's really kind of inspired, I think, the my approach to the grant. And I, I think that that's probably um, maybe in ways that other people are aware of or not aware of has kind of filtered in and, and throughout the grant. So hopefully this will be interesting regardless of um, one's familiarity with, with his work. So um, here we go. Um, so Jacques Bertin was a, a French cartographer working in especially the sort of second half of the 20th century. Um, he's most well known for, um, oh, all right, this is, there we go. Okay. Um, for a text he wrote and published in 1964 called The Semiology of Graphics um, that sort of lays out an entire kind of system for thinking about graphs and data visualization. Um, and I was especially excited to discover this because of a, a sort of my own interest in um, obviously in data visualization, um, but also in French theory. And so I, when I found this, I was like, oh, this is these are the two things that I enjoy really working on is, is French theory um, and data visualization. So it, it had this sort of nice overlap and, and kind of spoke um, two languages that, that I'm really very interested in. Um, and it's been published into to English and it's kind of this beautiful um, coffee table book. And so I won't go through all of it, but there were just sort of two things um, from the book that have really kind of stuck with me um, and shaped a sort of an approach to data visualization that, that it, for me, tries to be really kind of um, agnostic about technology. So I really try to think about visualization as a way of mapping data to space and then, you know, thinking about the different sort of possibilities there and then figuring out how to implement it in technology. Um, so right at the beginning of the book, and one of the reasons I love it is it's sort of, it's full of all of these um, sort of visualizations of visualization. And so there's this very early sort of small one, um, sort of comparing different system, different sign systems um, and, and these sort of two axes and, and sort of one is um, oral and one is um, visual. And one of the things that I think is, and then also whether it's monosymic, polysymic, or pansymic, so essentially whether it has a single or multiple meaning. Um, and one of the things I think is really interesting is that mathematics is listed as a, an oral system, which obviously we usually don't like read mathematics out loud, like a, a poetry reading or something like this, but we rather, um, you know, we, we write mathematics. But I, I think what the, the real division that he's getting at here is between um, spatial systems where we can take in lots of information at once and um, uh, temporal systems where we take things in over time. So even though mathematics is written, it's something that we read from, from left to right. And so I really like this sort of this kind of this ground setting of visualization as a way to display information spatially and, and arrange it in a way that um, that we can sort of take in a bunch of information at once and, and our eyes can move around. And then this sort of this movement from uh, very specific kind of hard coded in visualization all the way to abstract imagery. And, and I think he's not saying that it's necessarily objective, but that, you know, we have some sort of rules for creating these. And then the other sort of element that I, I think has, has really influenced me is, is this sort of this other graph that he makes of um, he divides sort of our, our capabilities of making graphs into the two positional variables. So the X and Y on the axis um, on the axes, and then the six, what he calls retinal variables. So size, shape, orientation, color, texture, and value. So he separates color and value. Um, and then um, creates this graph that it, it's worth, I think, spending a little bit of time with. Um, and you can just find it online. You don't need the whole book. Um, but then he sort of shows everything that the different retinal variables can, can show us. So you can see quantity and order or, or you know, quantitative variables, um, association and selection or qualitative variables, so grouping, telling when things are the same um, or different. And he goes through and he says, okay, so size is really the only one that can show us quantity. Um, value can show us order. So, you know, you can see if something is, is bigger or smaller, but you can't necessarily say, okay, this color is, you know, twice as big as this one. Um, and he goes, goes on in this way. And the thing I really like about it is that so much, I think of the approach to visualization. And if you think about, you know, if you go into Excel and try to create a visualization is it's really sort of based on this kind of chart chooser um, way to do visualization, right? You're in Excel and you say, okay, um, you know, I wanna make a scatter plot or something like this. Um, 
But thinking about it in this sort of semiological kind of way where we're thinking about arranging information over space and we're using you know, this very limited um, palette in a lot of ways with just these six retinal variables and the two positional variables. Um, it both, I think, sort of to my mind and in teaching students really kind of limits, it shows you the limits of what visualization can do, but in showing the limits, I think it also sort of informs us of all of the kind of diverse possibilities and the different ways in which, you know, we can, even if, you know, it's, it's um, monocenic in the sense that, you know, a point at five, five means that the data was, you know, five and five, but the, the sort of the stories and narratives we can tell from this, this really kind of simple system um, expand almost infinitely. And so um, I think I'll just leave it there for the sake of time and, and happy to answer questions. But I, I do think that, um, you know, this work has been incredibly important to me and just sort of thinking about both the limits and the affordances of visualization and seeing information displayed spatially and the different stories and uh, narratives we can tell from it um, is incredibly powerful um, and, and really informs my approach to data visualization. So thank you. Thanks so much, Chestin. That's great. Um, we have just about eight minutes left for our final talk. So I wanna make sure we have that full time for them. So let's go ahead and turn it over to Dolores and Dorothy to talk about the data visualization literacy framework. And I'm working on sharing the screen. So, oh, there we go. I can do that. That's okay. great. Can you see it? PowerPoint? Okay. Yep. Okay. Well, this is going to be uh, a, a framework for data visualization a very short framework for data visualization are foundations and threshold concepts. So uh, for those of you who don't know us, my name is Dolores Carlito, and I am at UAB's Mervyn Stern Library. And my interests, I got into this because of uh, teaching classes about multimodal composition. And so those are my interests. Dorothy? Um and my name is Dorothy Ogden. I'm the head of emerging technology and system development in UAB Libraries Technical Technology and Technical Services Department. Um, and I uh, was previously a health sciences librarian. And so I developed an interest in, in this in looking at different ways people were talking about data visualization within health sciences librarianship. Um, and now in my current role, I'm also interested in looking at how this relates to some of the projects we're going to do in our technology spaces, including uh, data walls, data displays, and using products from the Adobe Creative Cloud uh, for a multi to support multimodal literacy. Okay, we have these four frames, and just uh, to outline them, data and its visualization can be manipulated to achieve a desired result. Data visualization is information, and information has monetary value. Data vis tells a story and content is culture and community based. And so just to quickly break them down and what they mean. So if data can be manipulated to achieve a desired result, that means that data itself is an object. It can be manipulated for positive or negative means and that the communication can change between the transmitter and the receiver. So the, the noise source, which would be the visualization, can affect how the data is seen and uh, interpreted. So as an example of that, I have this. So it, you look at it and you think, oh, well, wow, look at how those numbers have gone up. But you'd have to, you have to notice that it shows random months, October through April, why that? The y-axis starts at 150, make it seem scary. Uh, it doesn't say that at, it had decreased substantially. It has decreased substantially since 2008. If you look at the colors they've chosen, black and blue like police versus the red, the yellow and orange that looks like fire and danger. So they have used this visualization and manipulated several aspects of it to get a point across. Oh, 
right? Um, our next frame, data visualization is information and information has monetary value, um, speaks to the idea that data is a currency of power. Um, lack of data literacy and understanding how visualization and visualization design um, can affect interpretation of information can widen gaps between haves and haves nots. And financial success can be determined by access to and understanding of information. Um, next slide. Um, this is just an example of one way in which data and data visualization can have monetary value. Um, this is an event plan assessment tool um, from several months ago uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and so this was a tool to enable people to make decisions about what size of events they could attend safely in what region of the country. Um, and so for this example, because Dolores and I both work in Alabama, um, I did look at Alabama looking at what the event tool would recommend uh, for me to be go and do in that region. And so you can see um, this would affect the decisions not only to attend public or private events, which impacts the economy locally, uh, but maybe longer term questions about whether or not to travel to Alabama um, to hold longer term events here, to start businesses here, to carry on business activities here. So looking at how um, a visualization can impact economic decisions about an area as one frame of reference um, for the power of data and data visualization. Our next frame is that the content is culture and community-based. So uh, the social semiotics affect how it's interpreted. And basically you have to know the language to understand the language. And so uh, here is, here's one I found and it's uh, most wickets in death overs in Otis. And I, I've heard of wickets. I know they have something to do with the sport. I don't know what a death over is. I don't know what Otis is. I don't know what AB is. I know it has something to do with cricket. And so this, uh, I don't speak the language of this graph. Uh, it means nothing to me. I had to look it up and I still don't really understand what it is. It has something to do. It is with cricket and something they changed in 2017 um, to related to ODIs and death overs, but that's not important. It's that uh, I don't speak this language, so I can't read this chart. You have to, be, you have to be because it's culture based or community based. You have to understand the culture of the community in order to understand the content. And then our last frame, data visualization tells a story. Um, so humans relate to the world through story, um, through a variety of media. We now get story as a main way to take in information, whether that's YouTube videos, commercials, or tweets. Um, and this defines data visualization as a rhetorical argument with visualization and form as data, of data as content. Um, one of the big quotes you'll find about this is people hear statistics, but they feel stories. Um, so data visualization can reinforce previous knowledge or be used to as a rhetorical device um, through design as well as the information that's included in the visualization. And our example for this, next slide. This is a two screenshots of an interactive visualization, um, again, that we captured last fall um, that were about how the candidates in the presidential election were spending on criminal justice ads on Facebook. And if you go to this uh, visualization and interact with it, it'll show you spending over time as you click through. Um, and so you can see um, President Trump's estimated costs were in the millions of dollars over time. And this graphic relates uh, what was happening socially at the time and in the news with candidates spending on the topic of criminal justice on social media. So Facebook ad money on criminal justice topics. And so this tells the story of how, um, yes, these are just numbers, but how over time the candidates um, were showing their different values through their ad spending. Um, the implications 
are that of our framework is that um, the creator has is not just has to think in terms of being a user, a designer, a presenter, an evaluator. Um, and and Here's what I found. think. Whoops, sorry, that's my phone, my watch. Um, I did a class this past um, earlier this week, and it was um, looking beyond STEM for data visualization. It was an English class, English three fifteen. And I was talking to them about using data visualizations because it's a professional writing class. And they have to write a white paper and then incorporate visualization using data they collected from surveys or that they researched. And they did not think of them as themselves as anything other than just a creator. And so the implications of this frame, uh, that the, of this framework is that you're not just a creator but you have to take also on the roles of a user, a presenter, an evaluator. Another implication is that the, it's an evolving skill and it applies across disciplines and professions. And that the role of the library is to facilitate the development of proficiencies in abstract thinking. So we have a very large role in, in data visualization. Right now, with our status, we're reading more and broadening our search as it relates to data visualization and, and seeing how it ties into scholarly communication. We're looking at the ACR, ACRL framework and meta literacy and see how they interact. And uh, especially with the update of the visual literacy document, the framework for visual literacy in higher education. And we are starting to look again beyond STEM. Are there any questions? Thank you so much. I just love seeing that work. We had uh, we have already had a um, request for your slides and hopefully we'll be able to <laughs> be able to share everyone's slides via the symposium website and um, when we send out recordings, we'll try to make sure that all the links are up to, up to date. But thanks so much to all of our Lightning Talk um, presenters. Um, we have right now a 10 minute break scheduled. Uh, so we might want to preserve that 10 minutes and start our Visintel just a little bit late. But um, I hope you'll take a, a short break and come right back and we'll have a, a group discussion about Visintels, um, which were set up so nicely uh, by Ryan. And I encourage you, if you do have questions um, and you want to reach out to any of the presenters today, feel free to do so. Thank you. See you in a bit.